Hey everybody, and welcome to pre-show for Monster Monday. I'm DM Galabond, and this is Monster Monday for February 7th, 2022. Hope everybody has had a wonderful Monday. Uh, we'll be getting started in a couple of moments. Right now, you're li listening to Sirenscape in the background. That is all the musicians playing for their mead. Some patrons clinking glasses. Sometimes they will laugh, and sometimes one of them has too much to drink, and... <laughs> yep, that's what happens. Alright, so Sirenscape is a great app for all of your tabletop uh, games. We use it in all of my live streams, and uh, mostly it keeps up with us when I remember to change the soundscape from scene to scene. But uh, we'll get started at the top of the hour. All right. And if you're watching us tonight on Twitch, we would love it if you give us a follow. If you are... Um, you are joining us tonight on the uh, on YouTube, then it would be great to have you subscribe. And we, oh, there we go. All right. So. Everybody. Getting all of the monitors set up here. Have me a sip of my tea. Drinking some green tea this evening. down a little bit. In fact, come with me. We're going to step a little bit further away from the um, stage. We're going to go over in a corner by the fire here in our little tavern. And we are going to get started here. Okay, everybody take a seat. Welcome, welcome everyone to Monster Monday. My name is DM Galabond, and this is Monster Monday 4. February 7th, 2022. And tonight, we have a very special Monster Monday, because this is a Monster Monday that comes to us courtesy of a subscriber on the YouTube. Uh, Doug, thank you so much for requesting this. Tonight, the monster that we are going to look at is a monster that has a long history within D&D, and a much longer history beyond D&D. And that monster is Garyon. Uh, Garyon, that is the way it is pronounced. I went to the D&D Beyond, and there are a number of monsters in D&D Beyond that they have a little speaker next to. And it's somebody that works at Wizards of the Coast. And in the case of Garyon, it's none other, none other than Chris Perkins himself. You click on that little speaker icon, and they will pronounce the word the way that Wizards of the Coast pronounces it. So I'm not going to 
make any claims that Garion is the classically correct way to pronounce the name, but it is the way that Wizards of the Coast pronounces it, so that's the pronunciation I'm going to use throughout tonight. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and find out a little bit about Garion. Garion has two origin stories. I guess actually there's one origin story, but then that origin story was co-opted. And it's a really interesting thing to see where, uh, where this comes from and how this monster is morphed even before it gets to D&D. And then what that does to the monster once it arrives in D&D. So, as with many of the named angels, devils, and demons in D&D's history, the origins of certain boss monsters come from long before there was ever such a thing as d and the case of Garion, there are two sources for the monster. Garion first appeared chronologically in the literary record as the fearsome triple-bodied ruler of Erethea in Greek mythology, he was one of, or it was his cattle that was one of the toils of Hercules. So one of the 12, 12 toils, 12 troubles of Hercules uh, that he had to go and uh, he had to go to the island of Erethea and uh, slay the cattle of Geryon. All right. Or, or no, not slake the cattle, but capture the cattle of Garion and bring it back to to his king or something like that. So that is the first instance of Garion. Then Garion also appears in Dante's Inferno. More specifically, he appears in Canto 17 of Dante's Inferno. And... The Dante version seems to be the one that most influences D&D, but we'll see that the Greek influence uh, figures in there at one point as well. So uh, both of the sources are uh, both of the sources were are uh, reflected in the various versions of D&D. Uh, the AD&D 1st Edition, 2nd Edition, and 3rd Edition, and 5th Edition versions of Garion draw more inspiration from Dante, but the 4th Edition of Garion fuses the Greek and Dantean visions of the monster. Now, the image we see here is actually artwork from or for Canto 17. It's not original artwork for Canto 17, but it's a, a later artist's interpretation of uh, the poet Dante and Virgil riding on Geryon, because Geryon lives in one of the circles of hell. And it, it, while I'm not a student of the, the Inferno, and I'll confess I didn't read the whole thing, I just you know saw little bits and pieces of it as I was doing my research, it, it seems like Either they were able to compel Garion to be of service, or he willingly allowed the two poets to ride on his back for whatever reason. And he carried them from one part of one circle of hell to somewhere else that they were going, let them off, and then he sped away. And so that's where he appears in the Inferno. Uh, and in the Twelve Labors of Hercules, the hero Hercules has to fight Garion in his tenth labor. And this is an island called Erethea, and in this myth, Garion is a three-headed and six-legged six giant. So the Garion of Dante has the upper body of a man, the uh, lower body of a serpent, and wings that he flies with. All right, now... In this particular image, we see uh, an image from the Tales of Hercules. Once again, not an original image, but this is a fragment of something. And I really don't know whether this is more modern artwork that's made to look like. I think it is, because I think you can see up in the top there sort of the more modern artist uh, uh, name up there. Um, 
but this is supposedly Hercules fighting the three-headed, six-legged giant uh, Geryon during his uh, troubles. All right, so now if we look at how he's described throughout the editions of D&D, we see in first edition when he first appears, a handsome head and torso sit atop Geryon's snaky trunk. This archdevil has no legs, but he travels in a snake-like mode along the ground. He has huge bat wings. His tail is barbed and drips poison. Geryon's arms are strong and hairy, ending in paw-like hands. Then in 2nd edition, we learn that the archdevil Geryon has a handsome human-like head atop a long serpentine body. Powerful bestial arms with fierce claws protrude from his sides. And in 3rd edition, we uh, see that in appearance, Geryon resembles Mammon's current form. That of a huge serpent with a muscular humanoid torso sporting two large arms and a massive humanoid head. For all his bizarre appearance, Geryon's face and features seem strangely attractive and handsome in a raw animal sort of way. And then in 4th edition, we learn a trio of human humanoid torsos joined at the shoulders emerge from an impossibly massive serpentine trunk. Three faces of noble mane gaze out from uh, from their beards shaggy and tangled with neglect. Bestial arms dangle loosely below. The leftmost and rightmost torso each boast a single wing that curls outward, fanning the air in a slow, deliberate cadence. And then 5th edition, the description is much like the 1st through 3rd edition description. Okay, now looking at Laura, now, now here we start to see images of Geryon from D&D. This is an image that is used both in 2nd edition and in 3rd edition. Now in 2nd edition, he didn't appear in a direct source book, but he did appear in an adventure that, well, you'd have to think from the subject matter and everything, it was probably inspired, at least, by Dante's Inferno, as it was an adventure entitled A Paladin in Hell. And so Geryon is the ruler of uh, one of the... It's the fifth, the fifth level of Hell, I believe it's called. And he uh, is from a great citadel there called Cold Steel, and the adventurers have to go through that uh, through that citadel, and that's where they encounter and fight uh, Geryon. And this is a picture out of that particular source, and it was again reused in the third edition source when uh, that was published. So as far as D&D is concerned, Geryon's story is most completely detailed actually in two places. Geryon in Hell, is, or Paladin in Hell, uh, is where we kind of learn about uh, Geryon's backstory. Poor Geryon, he just could not catch a break. Uh, so when, drought, when devils rebelled against Asmodeus, Geryon was the only one of the archfiends to remain loyal. However, when... Asmodeus put down the rebellion, uh, he deposed Geryon from his position as ruler of Stygia, the fifth layer of hell, and allowed the icebound Levistus, who was one of the archfiends that rebelled against Asmodeus, to rule that plane in Geryon's place. And in fact, all of the rebellious uh, archdevils were, went unpunished and Geryon, who was the only one that remained loyal, was actually punished. So Geryon just couldn't catch a break. And then when we get to 4th edition, we'll see that's not the first time he's been done dirty. So to reach their goal in this Paladin and Hell adventure, the PCs uh, must battle their way through Geryon's fortress called Cold Steel to reach an even deeper and darker layer of Hell, where a temple to a good deity has been entrapped by forces of evil. Why was it entrapped? Hey, that's beyond the scope of this. If you want to know, go read that uh, adventure or go play through that adventure yourself. 
All right. So now here's a little bit more of what we learn about Garion in each edition. So he's sometimes referred to as the wild beast. Uh, Garion is the gigantic ruler of the fifth plane of hell. The archdevil is as powerful as a storm giant, and he loves to grab his opponents and rend them with his claws while stabbing them with his terrible poisonous tail. Uh, and this is in first edition, so you save versus poison at minus four, or you die. So Garion dwells in a huge castle in the very middle of the plain and seldom ventures forth. Whoops. So then in second edition, we learn that Garion's preferred weapons are his powerful fists. Occasionally he resorts to weapons such as the axe and shield in his room. He attacks three times every two rounds of the weapon, adding plus 12 to his damage rolls for his strength of 24. He makes only one, uh, one attack with the weapons in a round. He can also strike with his tail stinger at the same time. Now, in 3rd edition, they say, although some call him the Serpentine Lord, Garion's enemies also name him the Lord of Filth. This label obviously plays off of his former Lord of the Fifth title, much like Beelzebub's Lord of the Flies or Lord of the Lies moniker. However, such a reference is ironic in Garion's case, for the Archdevil despises uncleanliness and dirt, demanding that servants keep himself and his surroundings immaculate. This need seems at odds with the Devil's otherwise bestial appearance and, and nature. Some think him a little bit mad. And in 4th edition, we will learn a little bit why he might be mad. So, called the Wild Beast, the Trifold Duke, and in the modern age, the Broken Beast, Garion was once the ruler of Stygia, fifth layer of the Nine Hells. For a time, Garion enjoyed all that Asmodeus promised him and more. That's from 4th edition. Well, what was he promised? We're getting there. And in 5th edition, we learn Garion is locked in an endless struggle with Levistus for control of Stygia. Two have fought each other for centuries, each displacing the other innumerable times. Currently, Garion occupies an odd position in the Infernal Hierarchy. Although Levistus still claims lordship over Stygia, he has been trapped in an enormous block of ice at the command of Asmodeus. For his part... Garion marshals his followers and seeks to discover a means to replace his hated rival. Because Garion, after all of what has happened to him, he's still trying to get back into Asmodeus' good graces. So this is uh, this guy is quite complex. And there's a lot to him. All right, this is a picture here of Garion from fourth edition. And you can see a little bit where he's got the three heads and kind of uh, three, well, looks like four arms. So the uh, right head has a right arm, the left head has a left arm, the middle head has two arms, and then there's these big bat-like wings and his... Uh, and his serpentine body. So this three-headed version of him, that's kind of the nod that D&D &D made toward, uh, toward the Dante version of him. Or no, toward the Greek version of him. All right, so fiends are creatures of wickedness, uh, native lower planes, fewer servants of deities, many more labor under the leadership of archdevils and demon princes, and some, like this guy, is an archdevil himself. All right, now we're going to go take a look at the mechanical features of Garion. So we will go ahead and move over to our web pages. And this is uh, Garion's appearance from first edition in the Monster Manual. He uh, is shown here with his ram's horn, and, or his, uh, I guess it's a cow horn. Um, in some places it's a uh, ram's horn, in some places it's a cow horn. So it's referred to as wild beast, gigantic ruler, uh... Garion is able to use any of the following powers at will once per melee turn, 
as applicable, Ice Storm, Wall of Ice, blah, blah, blah. A lot of cold-based attacks because uh, one of the things that's strange in Dante is that the closer you get to the center of hell, the colder it gets until the ninth and lowest layer of hell is just completely frozen. Uh, a big, huge block of ice. Now, Garion has a great bull's horn that he can wind. It brings forth five, five D four minotaurs. These minotaur, minotaurs will obey to the death. The horn can be blown once a week. All right, so that is uh, that is Garion in first edition. Now in second edition, we uh, this is from the Paladin Hell Adventure. And back in those days, if they introduced a new, uh, uh, if they introduced a new monster, they would sort of give you some details. Uh, and there's a nice long, uh, several-page spread about Garion. I'm not going to read all that. Uh, I'll let you go find Paladin Hell. You can find it on Drive Through RPG or DM's Guild and buy yourself a copy and read it. Uh, he. Uh, talks all about what happened to him and we're going to summarize that when we get to fourth edition and give you more of a complete view of his story so he's an archdevil armor class is negative three he has a movement of 30 feet a flying speed of 180 feet uh, 133 hit points uh, thaco of one so he can hit an armor class zero on a roll of one on a d20 so you don't he basically can't miss an armor class zero. So it's very easy to, for him to hit anything. And he has three attacks that uh, his two claws do 3d6 each. His tail stinger does 2d4. His gaze causes fear. Uh, two successful claw attacks indicate the victim is held, suffering 3d8 points of damage per round and automatic stinger attacks. And has to make a bend bars roll, which is the same as a grapple check, to escape. Uh, tail stinger injects poison, instant death. Saving throw and negative four penalty negates. Uh, casts at 24th level, once per round. So he can cast all of these things once per round. And this is his big picture. So all of this magic that he has, once per day, can create a symbol of pain. Use unholy word three times per day. Can gate in uh, Osilus or one uh, Galagon. All right, he is ten feet tall, thirty foot long. Uh, his morale is fearless, and he has the horn of the bull that uh, summons five D4 Minotaurs to serve the summoner unto death. So if you ever destroy him and get his horn well then you have all these minotaurs you can uh you can uh control all right third edition garyon deposed lord of the fifth or lord of filth he has 495 hit points speed of 40 feet armor class of 40 his claws are plus 40 melee attack and his tail slap is plus 38 melee attack. Uh, his damage from his claws do 2d8 plus 13 plus 1 vile. And uh, tail slap 1d8 plus 6 plus poison. Now I forget what what vile means. There's a mechanical term. That's a mechanical term in 3rd edition. Uh, so his fear gaze, improved grab, poison, spell like abilities... Uh, and his saves, uh, he's got his ability scores, strength of 36, constitution of 35, uh, all of these skills he has, all of these feats that he has, uh, challenge rating of 22, and his treasure is quadruple standard. So, uh then all the details about how he fights and everything. Now, in 4th edition, he doesn't appear in a source book. He was published as an article 
in Dungeon Magazine, Dungeon number 176. And this is his history. Now, Garion began his history not as a devil, but as an angel. One of the greatest angels of he who was, favored above nearly all others. Some have suggested his betrayal at Asmodee as his hands was nothing but payment for the treachery that Garion himself once committed. So, before the uprising, in the angelic hosts of he who was, only a few stood higher than Garion. As being partly of flesh and partly pure astral light, he flew on gleaming wings through all creation for errands of the god whom he loved more than anything. Well, almost more than anything. He was one of a band of seven of the most powerful angels who traveled together, fought together, worshipped together, and together shared a love that transcended the mortal definition of the word. For one another, these angels would have sacrificed all that they were. So, these seven angels go out and fight a monster. Monster's not really named, but it's, but it's referenced in the, in the Codex of Betrayal. And the fight was so bad that four of the angels were killed outright. Three of them returned back, and all of them were gravely wounded. And they all would have died. And he who was the deity that they all worshipped could only save one of them. So he chose to save Garion. But in order to save Garion, he had to take pieces of the other two angels and fuse them into Garion. And over time, Garion had, well, first of all, Garion had a little bit of what we would today call survivor's guilt. He lived, the rest of his companions died, all of his companions whom he loved dearly. But he also began to realize that he had thoughts and emotions and feelings that weren't his own. They were coming from these fused parts of uh, these angels. And so now he had voices in his head, and it was starting to drive him mad. Well, when Asmodeus decided that he was going to rebel from he who was, Asmodeus came to Garion and said, Garion, Gary baby. Gary, come to my side, baby. I'll make all that madness go away. And I'll put you in a place of honor. Trust me. Trust me. It's your boy. It's your boy, Asmo. I got your back, Gary. On. You'll be fine. Come on. Come on. You know you want to. You know he messed with you. He gave you that madness. I can take that madness away. Don't you trust me? And for whatever reason, Garion decided, All right, Esmo, I'm in. And that is the promise that Asmodeus made to him. Is that he would have this madness relieved. Well then of course. When Asmodeus was betrayed. Not only was Garion punished by being kicked out of his leadership of the fifth circle of hell. But that protection from his madness went away. So now those long quelled voices of those other angels they're just eating at him again and they're probably not very happy that he now has betrayed so he he was a betrayer and then he was betrayed and he is just a a grief-stricken madness-stricken angry raging horrible archdevil he's a guy you don't really want to mess around with if you know what's good for you so uh we do get a stat block for him he's a level 30 solo controller he's got a thousand and ninety two hit points 
armor class of 44. Uh, he's immune to domination. Resist 30 fire, 20 poison. Uh, speed 7. Uh, fly 5. His claw, he'll reach 15 feet. Plus 35 to attack. Um, 3d8 plus 10 damage. And, knock the, and the target's not prone. The grasping claw... 3d8, 10 damage, and the target's grabbed. Slashing Claw, 3d8, 10 damage, and slides the target three squares. And there's a Brutal Smash. Uh, the Tail Sweep, Fearsome Gaze, Simple of Pain, Brutish Fury, Triple Actions. He doesn't roll initiative. He has set initiative counts of 35, 30, and 25, and he takes a full turn on each of those initiative counts. He cannot delay or ready actions. So... Basically, he gets to act three times with a full turn of actions, three times every round. That's why he's a solo monster. Uh, that's what they did back in fourth edition. That's the the way they uh, the way they did that. If you ever went up against a solo, whoo, they were bad news. Okay, uh, the. Uh, horn uh, is uh, the horn of Garion is a uh, it will summon a horn or it will summon uh, 4d uh, 5d4 horned beasts and these horned beasts they're not exactly minotaurs but they're kind of look like minotaurs uh, but that's the horned beast that is summoned by the horn in 4th edition they uh, they are minions, so they're level 30 minions, and all minions, regardless of their level, have only one hit point. Uh, but they attack with a ton of damage. Uh, they have plus 33 to their attacks and 18 damage if they hit. So that is a uh, that is fourth edition, Garion. All right. Now, in 5th edition, Garion was published in Mordenkainen's Tome of Beasts. And we learn a little bit about... They recap a little bit about his story. But basically, they just talk about his struggle against uh, Levistus for control of Stygia. And... Uh, so among the Archdevils, Garion and Zeriel are especially known for martial prowess. He's a fear... fear Ferocious hunter and relentless tracker. His ferocity serves him well in Stygia's frozen waste, but also has limited his ability to collect souls and forge an effective hierarchy. Then, Garion in the uh, D&D Beyond Monster Book. See, this is where I got the pronunciation is from this thing right here. Has armor class 19, 300 hit points, 30 feet of movement, 50 feet of flying, of uh, strength of 29, con of 22, charisma of 23, uh, resist, he's immune to cold, fire, and poison, resistant to uh, bludgeoning, piercing, slashing, non magical attacks that aren't silver, true sight to 120 feet, telepathy to 120 feet, has innate spell casting, legendary resistance, magic resistance, magic weapons, regeneration. Uh, multi-attack with his claws and his stinger. His claws are plus 16 for 4d6 plus 9 each. His stinger is uh, plus 16 for uh, uh, 2d4 plus 9 piercing damage. And if you fail a DC 21 constitution save, you take another 2d12 poison damage and have the poison condition. Now, furthermore, if you get, uh, if the target of a claw is large or smaller, it's grappled, escape check DC 24, and a target that's already grappled takes an extra 68 slashing damage. So this guy is no joke. And then he can also magically teleport along with any equipment he's wearing and carrying up to 120 feet to an unoccupied space. Has three legendary actions, has that infernal glare, 
a swift sting, and the teleport. Now, uh, there's uh, there's a variant for Garion that adds the horn action, and he can do this one time a day. He causes five D4 minotaurs to appear in unoccupied spaces of his choice within 600 feet. They roll initiative when they appear. They remain uh, until they die. Or Garion uses an action to dismiss any or all of them. So, uh, Garion is a pretty bad boy in every edition of this game. Uh, he is not somebody that is probably going to wind up on your party's Christmas list. Um, and not someone that they are going to want to invite to dinner. Alright, so, let's go back and take a look at our, at the rest of this. So, Garion, how would you use him in encounters? How would you create a hard or challenging encounter with these creatures uh, for a party of five PCs by level? So, Garion is a unique creature, obviously. He's a CR-22 monster for... A party of level 17 through 19. He is a hard encounter. No additional uh, monsters needed. But when your party hits level 20, he's a medium encounter. And add one Maragon uh, to the mix. And you can see in 5th edition, he's like one of his arms ends in this horn. So... Uh, oh, no, I guess it doesn't. I guess that, that horn is just laying along his arm in such a way. But if you look really close, you can see his fingers wrapped around it. And then there's the the end of the horn here. That's that's weird, the way they drew that in the art. It makes it look like that horn is part of his arm. All right. Player tactics versus Garion. Use Holy Fire. Garion regenerates 20 hit points per round unless you hit him with radiant damage. Then watch the tail. The tail's not only poison, but it reduces maximum hit points by half the poison damage suffered. And it's got a reach of 20 feet. And silence that horn. So you can summon 5d4 minotaurs once per day with that horn. You really don't want this guy having any help when you fight him. Imagine you're fighting this guy, and then he blows that horn, and now suddenly you've got up to 20 additional foes on the battlefield that you have to worry about. Yeah, that would be a pretty bad day for your party. For most parties. Alright, so DM Tactics, if you are behind the screen with Garion, remember, remember everything that Garion has been through. He is very angry. He is not just mad, he is very, very angry. He's lost the favor of two beloved masters in his time. Uh, see that article in Dungeon 176 for more details. Anyone that crosses him is going to feel all of his wrath. So it's almost certain that Garion's going to be encountered in his lair. So you get to use the lair actions and the regional effects to your advantage as a DM. Also, blow the horn on the first round before the party can silence it. Then let the Minotaurs attack the PCs in melee while Garion stands back and casts spells and uses his legendary actions. So if the PCs survive the first wave of attacks from the Minotaurs and they are softened up and they have expended some of their resources, then Garion will move in and have him focus on the most wounded enemies first, clearing them from the battlefield with his tail's poison, health-reducing sting, and his vicious melee attacks. So if you want to use Garion and make your players hate seeing that guy, just have him be the kind of person that is going to uh, throw his army ahead of him let them soften up the enemies and then whoever's hurt most badly go after them and attack them first uh, and if everybody is kind of more or less equally hurt always go and try to kill the healers first and then deal with everybody else because if you get rid of the healers then you know the other people eventually you'll whittle down their hit points and there's nothing they can do about it 
So campaign placement. Where would you find Garion in a campaign? Well, since he's a ruler of one level of hell, it's really likely you're going to find Garion anywhere else outside of hell. So if you intend to put him somewhere, read up on his lore and find a really good reason that fits with his backstory and personality. Now, that's my that's just my advice. D and D is a game where every single game of D and D, every single DM has absolute, complete, uh, soul authority to do any and everything he or she wants at their table in their game. The DM is judge, jury, executioner, referee, rule book, and a deity of the entire table. Nobody can say anything against him or her at the table. It's just the DM's way or the highway. So the second adventure, A Paladin in Hell, requires the PCs to battle their way through Cold Steel, which is Garion's castle fortress, on their way to find the temple that they hope to free from Hell. Retelling that story is one way to use him. Another way might be to have the PCs need to take an item from Garion's palace and send them there on a mission. So this guy is a handful for a party of any level. So if he's not the main boss of your campaign, he's probably going to be one of the top sub-bosses in your campaign. And, now we don't do this very often. The Black Pudding earned this honor. And Garion also earns the honor of having a song. And I like to think, this is a song... That was penned for him by Asmodeus, probably in Asmodeus' diary. After Asmodeus coaxed and persuaded Geryon to side with him in the rebellion against he who was the deity that they all once served. What is the Geryon song like? Well... I'm not going to sing it for you. I have too much respect for your love of music to butcher music, but I will speak a few of the words to you. With all due apologies to the band Kansas. Yes, Gary on my wayward son, you'll have no peace when I am done. I will never let you rest. You'll cry evermore. <laughs> I can just picture Asmodea smiling as he puts those words down. All right. And last but not least, we look at how could we reskin Garyon. So we get a really interesting... There are several ways you could go with this. You get a really interesting look at... Um, his backstory in that dungeon article uh, from Dungeon 176 in 4th edition. And that glimpse of the ancient past lets us imagine a very different sort of Garion. Before the Dawn War that started time, at least in 4E cosmology, Garion was one of the seven most powerful archangels that served he who was. Uh, so we've talked a little bit about this. So now let's imagine a celestial Garion. Perhaps he would look something like a Coatl, that feathered snake of Aztec mythology with beautiful plumage. Uh, might be snowy white wings as, you know, most Western artists depict, uh, angels. Or... If you're going with the kind of uh, coatl thing, it might be more the beautiful, colorful plumage of a parrot or something like that. So his horn might be a golden trumpet that could summon angels to aid him in battle. And you could still have him portrayed as a fierce warrior, but instead of being filled with uh, madness and rage... He can be filled with kindness and compassion for all the good beings of the multiverse. So you could take Garion and sort of have a prelapsarian Garion, to use the uh, theological term uh, before the fall. 
so you could have uh, you could have uh, Garion as this uh, angelic figure. Now, another thing to think about with Garion, he is a great example of how you might, if you wanted to create a brand new monster for your table at D in D and D, how you might go back to classical works of literature or favorite fantasy novels or things like that, and find monsters that aren't in D and D at all. Uh, you could go to modern works, uh, things like the uh, the novel series that came out in the 1990s, up through the aughts, uh, The Wheel of Time, and you could make something like a Trolloc, which is in that in that particular book, it's kind of like a mad genetic scientist fusion of human stock with animal stock so you get humanoid bodies with like sometimes uh bird clawed feet or uh hoofed feet and uh the horns of anything from like a an eagle to a goat or a ram or a wolf or something like that uh and just these big huge uh, creatures so you could you could do something like that or you could go back to classical mythology go look through the um you know some of the most of the greek and roman myths all of those creatures and classical western uh mythology a lot of those creatures have been fused into D, D over the years but you might find some little known pocket of mythology maybe some sort of south american tribe or some african tribe or something that has a mythological creature or something maybe a native american tribe uh or some asian peoples uh maybe southeast asian or uh hindu you know down in the area of what is modern india uh something like that and find a creature that's not in D, &D and create that in the same way that D, &D found this garyon and if you find a creature that has two different origin stories uh, now i don't know what dante was doing when he pulled the name garyon and described him that way maybe Maybe Dante was a poor student of Greek, and maybe he just misinterpreted the way Garion was supposed to look. And instead of saying that he had three, you know, three heads and six legs, uh, he thought it said, "Oh, he had a uh, bat wings and a snake body." So, <laughs> you know, I really don't know really don't know where where dante got that uh whatever dante was smoking it was something pretty powerful uh to write that uh big long uh, poem the inferno but you know you can go and look at all of these kinds of sources and find those sorts of things to put into your game all right now we're gonna look and we're gonna see if we have any questions over here about Garyon, either on the uh, either on the YouTube or on the or on the Twitch. Okay, so we'll all right. Uh, don't see any right now. So let's go ahead and let's do the wrap up, and it'll come back and see if anybody has questions. If you do. Throw them in the chat, and I'll do my best to answer them. All right. I've been DM Galabond. This has been our Monster Monday on Garyon. Uh, my other shows, I have three uh, live stream games that I run every week. Uh, this week, the Thursday game and the Sunday game are on hiatus Thursday because I have a conflict Sunday because it's a Super Bowl. Saturday, we will be playing our second edition Saturday Night Greyhawk game, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Those all air simultaneously. They stream simultaneously on Twitch and YouTube, so you can watch on either platform. 
And we do have a Patreon if you uh, want to help us make even more content. Now, next week, when we come back from Monster Monday, we are going to be looking at the archaic from Strixhaven. A curriculum of chaos i thought we were going to start the strixhaven monsters this week but i had this request come in from the youtube so that got bumped ahead of strixhaven so keep that in mind if there's a monster we haven't done and you'd like it profiled on monster monday uh, you can go ahead and uh, throw that into the comments on a video and let me know and i will go ahead and uh do the research if I see it earlier in the week. If you wait until Sunday and ask me about it, yeah, it's not going to happen that week because I've already written Monster Monday by then. So, all right. Uh, I don't see any questions right now, so I want to thank you guys all for hanging out. Uh, hope you have a wonderful week. We're going to bring the music back up move back over towards the stage here in the tavern and while we listen to the music i will go ahead and uh find us somebody else who is running some dnt and we will go raid them so let's see Dusty Oven 32. Looks like they are running some D&D, so we'll go ahead and we'll raid them. Alright, everybody. Thanks again so much for stopping by and watching. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, actually, I guess we won't raid them. Uh, let's try Sad Gas Station. Sad Gas Station. Looks like they're running a Adventure League game, so... Alright, yep, there we go. Okay, everyone, take care, have a wonderful week, and watch out for the monsters under the bed. Good night, everybody.